Hi, everybody. Kurt Shaver with the Sales Foundry here. Welcome to the Bright Talk Sales Summit and the presentation on the Microsoft acquisition of LinkedIn. We're going to be talking about how it impacts sales and marketing. So welcome, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. So I'm sure everybody heard the news 23 days ago, three weeks, two days ago. Big news, Microsoft to acquire LinkedIn for $26.2 billion. That's with a B. So again, big news. I think this is really the biggest news to hit B2B sales and marketing really since Salesforce.com launched 17 years ago. You know, when that happened, uh, we didn't know the day that it launched that it was going to have such a big impact. You only know that in hindsight. But I think in a few years, we will look back at this blending of the world's biggest software company with the world's biggest social network for business. And we'll look back at this date and say, wow, that's when it really all began because it's going to make so many changes in sales and marketing. That's what we're here to talk about today. So let's go ahead and get going. So the first thing um, I'm going to do is ask you guys a question. I just want to go ahead and launch the poll here and ask you guys, um, what what was your feedback on this, or what was your um, opinion of the news here? So I'm going to go ahead and and um, post this up. Um, let me pull my poll up here. Let me see here. Um, all right, here we go. So you should have that poll up, give you guys a chance to start voting on that. I'll release it, give you guys a few seconds just to see, you know, how did that strike you? Was it like, oh boy, this is going to be fantastic, or oh no, what's going to happen to LinkedIn? Or maybe you're not sure yet and the, the jury is out. So give you guys a few seconds, you should be seeing the poll up there now, give you a chance, I see the votes coming in, give you a few seconds to find that and weigh in on it, and then I'll we'll take those results and we'll go ahead and share the results with everybody. Okay, so it looks like uh, it's coming in. Let's see, right now we've got a split, actually. Uh, if people are either in the uh, good news camp or they're in the, well, we've got a, 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 okay, it's going all over the board now. It looks like the, the polling is picking up. So I'm going to give you guys just a few more seconds so we can cover all of our good information here. I still see people that are voting in. I'm going to come back to the list here, and uh, we will close that one out. And it looks like we ended up with uh, most, well, 45% saying good news, 13% bad news, 40% not sure yet. Okay, makes sense. All right, let's get going then. That's where we know where we're starting from, so let's get into it. The agenda that we have up then is to talk about what's in it for Microsoft, right? Why did Microsoft pull the trigger on this $26.2 billion acquisition? What changes can we expect in LinkedIn? And also, well, the Microsoft products as well. And then uh, finally, what steps should your company be taking now to remain competitive as the landscapes change in the way that business people are communicating, the applications that they're using, et cetera? So that's what we're going to be talking about here. And uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is, okay, so why did, Link, or why did Microsoft buy LinkedIn? Well, I thought this quote from Gartner Research VP Merv Adrian really summed it all up. If you look at this, this is about as succinct as you can get. It's about the data. And so I've got a couple screens here showing you the data around LinkedIn, and we'll just kind of walk through those to put a little color around them, and some of them we're actually going to be touching on later in the webinar. So first one, I think a lot of people know about this. LinkedIn has uh, 400 and Oh, I think it's about 40, 440 million, it says 433 there, but somewhere in that ballpark, million worldwide users. What a lot of people don't know is about a quarter of those are what they call monthly active users. The next element is that 20, 128 million of those are in the U.S., which is more than the number of people employed in the U.S., so that is interesting. We've also got 39 million students. A couple of years ago, LinkedIn really started this push to get into the universities, and there are separate university pages and you know a lot of content around, how, as graduates, how do you get out into the business network and get a job and things like that. So they really made a smart push to go younger to build those people that are coming out into the work workplace and making this an uh, uh, important pillar of their professional life. 
Then we've got company pages. Probably most people here on the line have company pages, which is a little bit more like your company website on LinkedIn. A lot of times you're going to have your blog articles and things like that on it, and a lot of valuable benefits out of that. A little bit about their rate um, and, and worldwide coverage in 200 countries and territories. Now we're going to look at some of the uh, kind of stats around the people that are in LinkedIn. Again, uh, a lot of traffic there. So that's one of the things that Microsoft wanted was a lot of traffic, 45 billion member view pages per quarter. The next one here, uh, seemingly kind of a trivial little fact, but you're going to see when we talk about some of the integrations of the products a little bit later on in this webinar where that this one actually comes into play. So LinkedIn knows what people's skills are, and that's because we've all told LinkedIn what our skills are or our connections by clicking on endorsements they've, our, our contacts, right, have told LinkedIn what our skills are. So whether your skills are in, you know, lead generation or uh, leadership or HR management or uh, supply chain logistics, whatever it happens to be, right, we've either listed those ourselves on our profile or others have clicked that as an endorsement. So that's some really valuable information when you think about it. And we're going to show how that plays out on a practical basis. Uh, 8% of Americans using it, 1 million professional post publishers. That's that long-form post on LinkedIn. So again, if you think about it, LinkedIn has this army of writers, right? Um, all, everybody that's posting a long-form post, which again is that sort of blog-like length articles you can put on your profile, right? Those are all free content contributors, which are drawing those eyeballs and contributing to those 45 billion member page views per quarter. So pretty nice business model going on there. Um, and then we got 19.7 uh, slide shares, just one of the other content options going on with LinkedIn. So lots and lots of data. And that, again, um, as Merv Adrian said, sums it up. Why did Microsoft buy it? It's for the data. So the next couple of slides um, actually are from the uh, official deck, the official Microsoft deck that they were using um, in describing the acquisition and why it's going to happen and some of the possible future product integrations. And so we're going to pull those up and show those to you guys. The first one is um, just want to put it in the context of if we think of LinkedIn as that professional network, it's all the information about those 433 million people. And then we can kind of think around it, all of the productivity applications that Microsoft is famous for. Um, obviously, we've got the Windows OS, but when we talk about things that people are going to interact with on a daily basis, it's more at the app level. Probably Outlook is going to be the, I would think, the first, the most obvious, possibly the most powerful integration point because that's really where people live is in their email, either in their email or, of course, in their calendar. And so those two elements of Outlook are going to be huge because all you're doing in email is you're talking to people who are going to have LinkedIn data surrounding to them or, let, or you're meeting with people in your calendar who, again, are going to have LinkedIn data associated with them. So that's a big one. Uh, Excel, uh, Skype, again, a lot of opportunities there. Skype, obviously, you're going to be having these communication online video chats and things like that with people. Great. Wouldn't it be nice to know everything about them? Uh, PowerPoints, where we're going to see a, a specific example come in. Um, Word, SharePoint, of course, the portal aspect to it. So we'll talk about those in a little bit. Uh, we'll talk about a couple of those in detail as we get into the product integrations. So um, here's one we're going to start off looking at, and uh, hope, hopefully you guys got your big screen because it's a pretty detailed-looking slide. Um, so it would be tough to see this all on the – if you're looking at this on your phone right now. But I'm going to go ahead and describe what all we've got going on there. So this is a view of a proposed new, new LinkedIn homepage feed, okay? And so – Right now, we're used to going into our LinkedIn homepage feed, and really the only information that comes to us from the LinkedIn homepage feed, of course, is what's going on with LinkedIn. It tends to be um, most of it is from your contacts, right? your level one LinkedIn contacts, what they're publishing, what they're commenting, what they're liking, sort of things like that. 
Um, the second source of information on your traditional LinkedIn homepage feed right now is uh, companies that you might be following. So if you're, you know, you have a target list of companies, hopefully you've got you're following them right now on LinkedIn off their LinkedIn company page, and so that any news and things that they update on their LinkedIn company page are going to show up on your homepage feed, thereby enabling you, if you're a salesperson, to catch the trigger events that might advance you with that particular target account. And then the third area is uh, if we've got the marketing people on the line, you probably know about LinkedIn sponsored updates, and these are where the company can essentially buy an ad and stick it into your homepage feed based on who you are. So that if you are a, uh, let's say you are a VP of sales and you're a company that sells sales automation software, then you can actually buy the right or the privilege to insert these sponsored updates in there. And again, I'm sure everybody's seen those on their traditional homepage feed. But now, or, or in the future, in the future, as these Microsoft products get integrated, you're going to be able to see other sources of information on there. So um, the first one that's showing here, and again, the background screen is showing, a, uh, I guess, a tablet, a slate tablet. And then in, in the front there, you're going to have the... Um, uh, the, the, the mobile device, the mobile smartphone. So what you're looking at there is uh, the first thing is information that's coming from Outlook now and somebody you've got an appointment with, Aram Jacobs, right? It's giving you some information and some background about him. So it's tying your calendar with the LinkedIn data, just telling you, hey, you got this meeting with this guy coming up. He was promoted to vice president three weeks ago. He hosted a session at this conference and you guys both went to the University of Michigan, right? M go blue. So, um, so that's one example. I'm tying these two things together. A uh, second one down there is giving you information about a PowerPoint. And so there's a, a PowerPoint that was created that you have access to that might be related to an upcoming meeting that you're having with somebody. So it's giving you that kind of information. And then the last one is showing a uh, a OneNote sort of source in there where, again, somebody may have been, somebody may have updated something in a shared information resource, and you can find out about that person and, you know, what their skill sets are and things like that. So that, so what we're looking at now is a um, proposed envisioned future LinkedIn homepage feed that is including more than just LinkedIn information now. It's tapping into information from your Microsoft productivity apps, okay? Now we're going to look at the flip side of that. We're going to now, we're, 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 the next slide here that we're going to look at, uh, oops, sorry, we got one uh, use case and then the, the slide I was going to mention is going to come up. So this is a use case just uh, describing again what might be happening with the Microsoft Virtual Assistant, which is called Cortana, right? It's sort of like Apple's Siri. So uh, this is a, so you might be, you know, just grab your coffee or something. You're walking down the street to an appointment, and uh, Cortana comes on and you know talks to you and says, "Hey, Jen, uh, you're meeting with Sam next. You and Sam both went to University of Washington. You both know Cindy Smith. Hey, good news, the Huskies won last night, right? Do you want to look at Sam's profile? Um, do you want to see the meeting history that with you with Cindy and Sam, right, et cetera, et cetera? So in this case, right, we're really getting a little bit more advanced. We're using the personal digital assistant, the personal dis digital assistant. Microsoft product, again, has access to both uh, application, productivity application information, as well as personal information through the LinkedIn network. So that's pretty cool. And here's the one that I was alluding to, um, the, the flip side of looking at your LinkedIn homepage feed with Microsoft data in it. Okay, now this is the, the reverse of it. So now we're actually in a Microsoft application. So the scenario that we're looking at on the screen now is uh, assuming that you would be in Microsoft PowerPoint, and let's say you are um, maybe you're, you know you're a manager of a software company or something, and you're doing a PowerPoint on programming fundamentals. Okay, so this is pretty cool uh, when you think about all the things LinkedIn has to bring. So again, I'm going to kind of walk through this, and I know it's kind of detailed there. So I'm going to walk through that. We've basically got four slices of information in that um, on the right-hand side. So again, put yourself in this mindset, okay, that you're a, you're a 
manager for software development company, you're doing a PowerPoint right now on programming fundamentals. Maybe you just got VC funding, you're going to be hiring a bunch of these new programmers, you want to make sure they all have the same basis, and so you're going to make this presentation. Okay, great. Now, here's how the integration of LinkedIn with Microsoft PowerPoint could help you. Okay, so across the top, first horizontal band says, um, okay, at your company, here are co-workers who could help you. Here are co-workers who might help you, right? You may or may not be connected to them, but because LinkedIn knows that you work for this company called Contoso, right? You work for it, and it knows all these other people work for it. You may or may not be connected to them, but the stitch is really the LinkedIn company page. That's what's pulling you together. So that first horizontal band is saying people that you work with might be able to help you with this PowerPoint um, presentation because either the first group, right, which is – uh, where, right where it says coworkers who can help. So the first group has PowerPoint skills, right? They may be in HR, they may be in accounting, they may be in sales or marketing. They may not know anything about programming, but they know about PowerPoint. So this first group of people that work at your company might help you because they have great PowerPoint skills. They may be able to spiff it up. Now the other group there just to the um, right of them, these are the people in your company that have programming skills. And so if you need content help, not the pretty picture transition graphic help, but if you need content help, these are people at your same company who might be able to contribute on the content side. Okay, So that's pretty cool. Now let's go to the second horizontal band there. Second horizontal band is saying people that you are connected to, obviously could be in or outside of your own network, people that you are connected to in your LinkedIn level one, they might have PowerPoint skills or they might have programming skills, okay? So the second, first band is your company. Second band is your personal network. Hence, that is one of the reasons that you always want to be growing your LinkedIn professional network and now more than ever because, again, handwriting is on the wall. We're going to see all these things happen in the future. The bigger and stronger your network, the more likely you're going to have these types of opportunities. Okay, so the third band down there is something that might be kind of new to most people on the line because it's pretty new to everybody. So the third line there, you've got the little LinkedIn square, and underneath it, it says the word ProFinder. So ProFinder um, is this brand new thing that LinkedIn has been doing a, a, a slow release of. And it's essentially a, a freelancer marketplace, right? It's a um, so so entrepreneurs, consultants, um, folks like that. It's kind of like um, Fiverr or Elancer or Odesk, right? So if you know about those types of things, where where you know you can pick up a hey, I just need a graphic designer for this job, or I just need a programmer for two months, or I just need somebody to translate this PDF into an Excel spreadsheet for me, right? Whatever it happens to be, you can kind of go in and it's a marketplace. It's a listing. It's a directory where you can go in and find people, consultants that'll do typically like small little jobs for you, right? You're not going to hire them as full timers. You just need this little job done. So, um, so LinkedIn is launching that program. So if you are in that world, uh, just as an aside, you might want to check out LinkedIn ProFinder. You can get listed there. Um, I'm actually listed on that for sales training, and, uh, and I have received um, inquiries from people. But it's just getting going. But you can certainly see, again, if you think back to when we were looking at the data and the statistics, remember I talked, I said, remember that thing about, you know, what, what, it was like 45,000 um, uh, skills or let me see. Let me, let me get the exact number here. I'll pick it up because I can go um, backwards there. Yeah, 45, 45,000 standard skills um, that are listed for people. So again, in the example here, obviously one of the skills might that you might want to contract out for would be PowerPoint expertise. So. If you didn't have anybody at your company, you didn't have anybody at your network that could help you out, then maybe you could pay somebody to help you out, right? Maybe you're giving this presentation at the, you know, International Programmers Association. It's not just a little thing you're doing in the as a lunch and learn in the break room, but this is actually a super big deal, and you're going to become the president of this association, and you want to make sure this thing shines, then you might want to get a pro to, to dress it up. And then the last element there, number four, 
um, are, is showing you courses within the lynda.com online training platform that Microsoft Link, LinkedIn bought about a mm, little over a year ago, I think, a little over a year ago. LinkedIn bought lynda.com. At that time, it was LinkedIn's biggest acquisition to date. And they have thousands and thousands and thousands of online courses. So again, going back to the context of this scenario, you're a programming manager at a software company and you want to get help making sure this is the world's most awesome programming fundamentals PowerPoint, then you might actually want to click into one of these courses about PowerPoint. And if you have a Linda subscription, then obviously you can go in, and that's partly of where LinkedIn is monetizing it, and hence in the future, Microsoft will be monetizing it. So I, th I just I love this slide because I think this one really paints the picture of the benefit of these two things coming together. It's it's basically situational help based on either um, your coworkers, your network, the ProFinder freelancing directory, or the lynda.com online uh, training system. So those are some of those looks. Now, as as you start to think about this, right, I, I sort of had this vision of uh, the Minority Report movie. This is, gosh, I don't know, it's probably got to be like at least 15 years old. But if you guys saw this movie, it was it was really this, you know, crazy look into the future. Uh, Tom Cruise was this, uh, he was basically a, you know, a, uh, a cop of uh, some way, shape, or form. Um, but he had this big, like, glass data field that he could come in and manipulate all this information, look at this data, and that's what we're looking at right now. And uh, so it had a lot of this, you know, big brother knows all this information about us sort of a feel to it. So with that, um, I was just curious. That this really brings up a, a, a issue that a lot of people have been discussing um, around this because – if you think back to that PowerPoint example, you know, there's many, many great benefits out of that PowerPoint example. But at the same time, in order to get those benefits, you have to know a lot about people, right? You have to know where they work. You have to know whose network they're in. You have to know uh, what skills they are. Or rather, I should say, the system has to know what company they are at. The system has to know what skills they are, right? The system has to know if they're in this Elancer market. And so um, when the system has to know all this stuff, there's a trade-off there between the personal information that people are going to uh, be able to access. And when I say personal information, I'm talking about um, personal information, but yes, sort of around your business persona that would be captured in LinkedIn. So it's you know, what's my name? Where did I go to school? What's my job title? How long have I been there? What are my skills? Right? Where do I, what's the location that I'm in? It's all that type of LinkedIn data that we all willingly give to LinkedIn. So where, where do, you know, where do we make that trade off? Where do we draw the line between the personal information and the privacy? If people have any um, ideas or feedback or something like that, you can type that into the uh, feedback area or or you can, um, you know, you can type it into the uh, questions area as well if there's any discussions about the privacy and the personal information. But it's really just something that I think will, will play out. And what my, my feeling of it is, is as, as long as it's, as long as it's um, clear to every member and they can control it, right, it's sort of like a slider bar, really. I mean, the more information that you want to be able to get about people in these applications, then the more that you have to be willing to give up. Um, so you should expect that everybody's going to get treated the same way as you are. But if you want to be a little closer to the best, that's fine. Just realize it's going to limit some of your information. If, you want, if you're pretty comfortable and want to be transparent in order to get more information, I think you should do that. So again, as long as I think people have the control to decide where it is, I, I think most people will be fine and, and kind of trust that as they go along. Now, um, the next thing worth mentioning is, uh, excuse me, um, the next thing we want to talk about is a little bit about the cultures of the company. Um, there's a lot of uh, differences there, and, you know, I'm kind of representing those by the old, the old PC guy. You remember from the PC and Macintosh world, the old PC guy, and then we've got sort of some teenager in there, because if we think about 
the companies themselves, right, there's obviously a lot of differences in there. Uh, Microsoft is a 40-year-old, 40, 40 not a 40-year-old virgin, but it's a 40-year-old software company. Actually, I think it's 41, but, you know, who's counting? Um, whereas LinkedIn is, is just turned 13 years old. So it's a, it's a social networking company, not a software giant. LinkedIn, big in terms of social networks, but still pretty small in terms of companies compared to Microsoft, obviously. Microsoft, when I say open products here, you know, what I'm really talking about is the fact that obviously uh, Microsoft really built its company, its value on both the open operating system, which was designed to work with any PC based platform, but also the productivity applications themselves. The, you know, the words, the PowerPoints, the Excels, and things like that, obviously those cut across both the PC world, their sort of original foundation, as well as work in the Mac world as well. So they tend to kind of play this um, game where like, hey, we want to play with everybody, we want to be available on as many platforms as possible, et cetera. LinkedIn, on the other hand, is a very closed network, sometimes described as a walled garden. So LinkedIn is very... Um, uh, controlling, they don't allow you know companies to have APIs into that uh, into the into the data set. Uh, everything is is very much controlled in just a LinkedIn world, which kind of is ironic because that's much more of an Apple type of a philosophy, if you think about it. Even though it is a social network, and then finally, if we think about so that's really on the product level. If we think about their go to market strategy and how they've sort of grown the company. You know, Microsoft has really taken a partner sales model. Uh, Microsoft has over 60,000, you know, Microsoft reselling solution providing partners that sell their products. And obviously that's part of the reason why they have such a huge footprint. And they are the world's biggest software company. LinkedIn, on the other hand, uh, has, again, chosen kind of a very closed sales model. Um, only LinkedIn people sell the LinkedIn premium subscription, which are sold into enterprise accounts. Uh, there's really three divisions within LinkedIn that, that sell subscriptions to companies. There's a group that sells recruiting solutions into HR departments. There's a group that sells marketing solutions, obviously, into the marketing departments. And there's a group that sells the LinkedIn Sales Navigator product into sales departments. So those uh, are three groups selling into three departments of enterprises. But again, it's all badged LinkedIn people. It's not a partner type architecture like Microsoft and Salesforce and a lot of other companies have. So, you know, we'll have to see how that plays out in the, in the cultures. It'll be interesting to see how that, that, came, that came in. Now, um, so uh, I'm seeing a, a comment here um, back on the privacy. Somebody had shared the comment here that, hey, because LinkedIn data is essentially professional information, right, the, the information, right, shouldn't be um, as private maybe as on Facebook. So they think that, you know, the data sharing should be um, okay there. You know, on Facebook, that, that, is, that is personal, personal data. LinkedIn is sort of like personal business data. So, right, you don't have in, so much information maybe about, like, where your house is and, oh, I was just on vacation in Italy last year or, hey, here's my two kids at the swimming pool type thing, right? You're not going to tend to have that on LinkedIn. So maybe there is a little um, uh, less of a concern on privacy as there might sort of be on Facebook. So thanks for that um, input on there. Okay, um, so... Here are a couple of ways that you can, that as a, as a business, right, you can really catch the social business wave, right? Three kind of simple steps to help get prepared for this just inevitable meshing of productivity apps with social networking that's going to come about through the acquisition, right? So the first one, first element here is to develop a coordinated social selling marketing strategy. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know what happened to that slide. Somehow the, the, something got off. It looks like it's clipped, but it should be um, develop a coordinated social selling marketing strategy. So when I talk about coordinated from a social selling standpoint, since this is the Bright Talk Sales Summit, we're really focusing on B2B sales and marketing here. So the real question is, you know, who's responsible for what? Because when, when, when we think of 
social networks, a lot of times we think of social media. Traditionally in a company, marketing departments have owned social media, and they've probably been at it you know, anywhere from five to ten years in terms of using social media from a marketing perspective. But now, as again, as it's moving more and more mainstream, it's uh, the first sort of large department that it's simply going to touch. It's going to be the sales department. Um, with a practice called social selling, which now, you know, that term didn't even exist three years ago. And now it's so mainstream um, that Microsoft's CEO even said the word in the initial press release, right, talking about the values of it, even said the word social selling. So, but social selling, become a social business, it straddles so many departments, right? And well, here's kind of a, a look at how that comes together. So, it, it has to do with media. So social selling, one of the components of it is media related, um, content related rather is a better term, content related. So marketing has a hand in that, obviously works on social networks. So sometimes within marketing, there's a subset. This depends on how big your company is, obviously. The bigger the company, the more segmented you're going to be. The smaller the company, you might have you know, one person wearing multiple hats. But again, just sort of functionally, We've got overall marketing. Part of overall marketing is social media leveraging social networks, um, and that's great. But in a company, the marketing department usually only controls those marketing-run properties. So they might have one Twitter account, one LinkedIn company page, one Facebook page, right, one YouTube channel. Um, and it's just like the one company website that they have. But then when we actually start thinking about the sales force, if your company has 500 salespeople, well, that's 500 LinkedIn profiles, 500, you know, could be Twitter accounts and things like that. So the, the multiplying factor is huge. And that's why companies are moving into the so social selling because the amplification of the company's social footprint is tremendous, right? It could be factors of 500. So that's why it's so huge. So kind of, Oftentimes, in, but so the salespeople are the ones that are going to practice this. That's where you're going to get the amplification because you have big numbers of salespeople that also have big social networks. But then in between that, down in the bottom in the green, right, again, depending on the size of the company, you're going to have some function usually. Sales enablement might be called. Sales training might be called. Sales operations. There's somebody in there a lot of times that can provide this transition. It's not actually these salespeople, but they can be the go-between between, between the social media people and marketing and actually providing the skills and the mechanisms for getting these tools that can all come together. And that's why you have to kind of get this strategy together and figure out, okay, what are the functions that we're going to need to perform and then who's going to do them? So number one is get that strategy in place. All right. Um, now we're going to ask the question, um, does your company, does your company have a clear social selling strategy. So I'll go ahead and post that up and let you guys vote on that. And we'll just kind of see where people are in terms of company having a clear social selling strategy. So when we say social selling, in other words, a clear strategy of how your company's sales force is going to leverage social networks like I guess we're focused here on LinkedIn, which is certainly the biggest one for B2B, might also be Twitter. But does your company have a clear strategy on how the sales force is going to leverage social networks like LinkedIn. Give you guys a few seconds here to vote. I see we got at least people, some people that are voting on there now. All right. So, We've got, uh, okay, I still see some votes coming in. I'm going to give you guys another five seconds to vote on that. We're still looking good on time. we got about 11 minutes to the end of this session. Make sure to give you guys some chance to, to questions uh, while we're doing that. All right, I'm going to go ahead and stop voting now. And... I want to just come back and look at our results. So it looks like 23% um, of the people said, yep, absolutely. We have a social selling strategy. Almost half of you said, uh, not quite, but we're working on it. And then uh, almost a third said, um, none whatsoever. Okay, so I'm going to co close that. Give me 
just a second here. Okay, uh, whoops, I jumped one here. Okay, so um, so the second thing is, so the first thing is, once we get the strategy in place, then the next thing that we want to do is teach employees how to build their social networks, right? How to build out their social networks. And again, this might be a little bit different than how they're just going to be growing things out on Facebook or something like that in a, from a personal perspective, because they want to be thinking about the elements of the the people in the people in their so their business networks and those spheres of influence. So this is a exercise that we'll go through called spheres of influence when I'm running these social selling workshops with um, companies. And we have the salespeople or whoever else might be involved think about what are the business spheres of influence, right, that they would want in their professional network. And so some of the examples of those, if we were just to go around the horn, right, so some of the examples would certainly be um, groups like customers. That's the obvious starting point. And whether your salespeople is broken up into um, hunters and account manager farmers, or whether one person you know really handles both bringing in new business and serving existing customers. You've got customers, then you have prospects, obviously. Uh, you would have coworkers. We saw some of the examples there in that integrated PowerPoint slide where people were getting help possibly from coworkers. So coworkers are definitely good. Um, people that supply your company. All right again are, are are they have a vested interest in the success of your company so may be keen to give you referrals and things like that you've got um other beneficiaries a lot of times when one company sells part of a solution there's another company that would sell something else that makes for the total solution and so having those people in your network is very good a classic example of that is let's say you're a commercial real estate agent who else would you want to know right that might be a beneficiary in there well you might have um, you know, it might be the uh, funding people, it might be the office furniture people, it might be the um, architect or interior design people, it might be the people that run wiring and cabling for new infrastructures, right? So any of these things are sort of related in an in a, a, a ecosystem that would all be based around a company maybe moving into a new office or building a new building or something like that. Referral sources, um, friends and family possibly, and then networking groups, which could be offline chambers of commerce, trade associations, or online like you're going to find on LinkedIn. So these are the areas where you can start to build it. Again, all these changes are going to be coming as Microsoft starts to integrate this, but the things companies can do right now is to start to help their employees grow their professional networks because that's really where the big benefit, that's the value, it's those relationships that are established in the LinkedIn network that are so important. So that is one of the places to start. All right, the last thing then is to teach employees how to engage with content, how to engage with content. So they've got this network. Now what they want to do is to be able to share information. And there are three ways – to engage with content, and these are really in order of increasing sophistication as we go from left to right, okay? So the easiest thing to do is to just, when you're looking at your LinkedIn homepage, right, right now, today's homepage, when you look at the LinkedIn homepage, um, the easiest thing to do is to either just hit the like button, which is some form of engagement, or one step higher would be to actually comment on it. So you could, right, if you see something that's in your area of expertise that deals with your company, that's from one of your customers or prospects or something like that, then you can simply comment or react to what somebody else has already posted. Okay, so that's level one. Level two sophistication would be you start it out, right? You initiate this um, thread on LinkedIn by just sharing something that somebody else has already created. So you're just the sharer. You're not the creator. Sometimes, you know, we use the term curate before you create. So in being a curator, all you're doing is reading things on the web about your industry. And if you see something that you think is going to be valuable, it could be something internally produced by your own company, maybe a blog post, or it could be something externally that you read on a news site, trade association website, something like that. 
but you're going to share it with your audience because you know it's going to be of value with them. And then the third area, this is kind of the ultimate level, would be if you as an individual are actually creating your own content. Right? You are writing something up coming from your brain to your fingers to the keyboard and appearing up there on LinkedIn. You're creating original content. And, of course, that's kind of a, the high bar to strive for. But I, I don't, at this point, I don't expect every salesperson to be able to do that that's a pretty sophisticated, you can lead that maybe to the marketing team, um, maybe designated experts among people like sales engineers or product specialists or vertical industry specialists and things like that. And I think eventually every salesperson may get to that, but right now it's probably a little bit uh, too high of a bar to do. So what I'd like to ask people for now is uh, what, what was your key takeaway? If you can go ahead and you can put some something into the feedback area there. Um, uh, or you can type it into the feedback area or the question area, either one. And just tell me, you know, what was your key takeaway of the presentation that we've done so far, right? Um, you know, are you looking at, hey, I'm really excited about um, all the possible integrations of this data with the productivity app or hey I've got concerns about privacy or um, man I'm gonna start growing my network right now or I need to know more about sharing content or anything like that so give me a little feedback there it's always nice to see what people's reactions are and what the input is from that if you have any specific questions of course you can type those into the um, questions area um, so there's one up there right now, which I'll address. It says, um, how do you see the Microsoft CRM dynamics with LinkedIn becoming a game changer to Salesforce.com? Um, that's a great question. I think that it, it, I think it's going to make Microsoft Dynamics much more valuable um, and therefore much more competitive. Um, to really give Salesforce a run, right? The, the latest statistics that I saw in terms of market share for CRM systems had um, Salesforce out in the lead with about 18%. Um, then it was Oracle, then SAP, then Microsoft Dynamics in fourth place with about 6%. So Microsoft Dynamics is about a third of the market share of uh, Salesforce.com, um, but obviously this is going to give Microsoft Dynamics something that none of the other three have, right? It's just, I mean, the potential for it is just astounding because again, it's about the data, right? None of those, no other CRM system essentially comes with data, right? You, the 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 company has to fill it up. It's just an application. The company ha has to fill it up with data. Um, in its most integrated vision of LinkedIn and Microsoft CRM, uh, it could be in incredibly powerful because it could essentially come with the data. Um, and I think that could just give it a huge competitive advantage. So great question. Thanks for that one. Okay, so gang, we're going to um, wrap it up here. So I've got a couple things. I've got some resources that can help you and or your company increase uh, your LinkedIn skills. First off, I'll say, if you just want to go to my website at the Sales Foundry, if you want to get updated on these things as things change and you want to see new um, you know, blogs or editorials or webinars like this, right? you can just go there and sign up for my newsletter. I'll keep you up to date with it. If you want to go a little further than that, then I just – a uh, couple of months ago, I just updated my social selling boot camp. This is a self-study course that has 25 lessons in it, and each one has a short video tutorial to show you exactly how to do these various programs. And it's really designed for a busy salesperson to learn how to master LinkedIn and grow their business on just five minutes a day. Um, here is a comment from one of the students that went through it. You can see he's giving some LinkedIn metrics about how he you know, grew his network almost four times as big. His social selling index exploded. His profile rank you know, shot up. And as he says there, most importantly, he's now meeting, remembering, and staying in touch, impressing his clients that he's the go-to resource in his industry. So I'm having a little fun and giving a bonus discount on this. So since Microsoft spent $26.2 billion, I'm offering a 26.2% discount on this program in July if you use that discount code. And if you, if you just want to click on the links, you can go to the attachment 
um, sections of link of, of your screen right now in the attachment section you can see it right there you can just click on the link and go to that um, so again it's usually thirty nine dollars you're basically gonna say ten dollars if you buy it this month using that discount code with the twenty six point two percent discount so that's for anybody that wants to increase their individual LinkedIn skills if you are a sales or marketing leader this is a different option for you. If you're a sales and marketing leader, I will do a custom assessment of your team's LinkedIn selling skills, tell you how they're doing now, how they stack up to the competition. Um, and that is a service that I do at no charge for qualified companies that have at least 50 B2B sales reps. Um, you can get that request at assessments.thesalesfoundry.com. And again, you can see that in the attachments area that is in the in your um, bright talk control panel there listed under attachments. So with that gang, we are really at the end of the session. I'm going to jump back to see if we've got any other questions there that I'm going to um, answer. But because this is part of the summit, it's going to kick us out in about a minute. So I'll take a quick look at those. I want to thank everybody for coming. Start to build those networks. Start to learn how to share content because, man, these things are going to come faster than you think. And when it's all here, if you've got a head start, you're going to have the competitive advantages. So thanks, everybody. Kurt Shaver with the Sales Foundry. Um, we'll call this the official end. I'm going to jump back into questions here until it kicks us off. One of the great questions, is the data going to be sold or offered to companies wishing to pay for it? Uh, my guess is some, you know, it's going to be some form of that, right? I mean, it's, 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 there might be a, a little bit to whet your appetite, but certainly you're going to get graduated levels of access the more you pay exactly like LinkedIn operates right now. So as to how that's all going to play out, who knows, but that's where it is. All right. I just got the countdown that they're giving me a minute and a half. So I'll take a look at some other question. Key takeaway, uh, somebody said Microsoft will move tightly, uh, yeah, micro, Microsoft will move, will more tightly integrate with LinkedIn. Yeah, absolutely on that one. And uh, did I just see a couple questions here or a comment here about the privacy and access to information. All right, gang, well, I'm going to call that a wrap-up. Thanks to, again for everybody that hung on here for the last minute for the couple of uh, answers. And everybody, make it a great month of July and start to Q3.